Dear students of prophecy on YouTube, I would like to take a moment to talk about the mark of the beast, because so many people have come to believe somehow that the mark of the beast is a microchip which you get in your right hand or your forehead. And I've just found this um, pretty interesting because in the Bible it says that if you get the mark of the beast, you lose your salvation. And this is um, pretty interesting that it would have to be a microchip, seeing as the people who suggest this also say, once saved, always saved, which to my mind just does not square up at all. How if we are once saved, always saved, that if we cause this uh, little microchip to get in our hands, we lose our salvation? In the Bible, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That's, that's from John 10, verses 27 to 29. Did you know that in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, guys, um, keeping the commandments of God was bound for a sign between your eyes and also on your right hand? Did you know that? In Exodus 13, uh, speaking about the Passover, it says this: Exodus 13, 9 and 16. It shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hands, and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. And it shall be for a token upon thine hands, and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by the strength of hands the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. And again, it's also in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 8. And again in Deuteronomy 11:18 it says, Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hands, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. So get this, God's law is bound for a sign in your right hand or in your forehead. Doesn't that mean that the mark of the beast which is in your right hand or your forehead might be um, breaking one of the Ten Commandments? In the book of Ezekiel, um, the Jewish nation was in terrible apostasy. And you can read that in Ezekiel chapters 7 and 8. But there was a small group within uh, Jerusalem which were sighing and crying for all the abominations. And God said that these people who um, keep my commandments and are not swept away into the idolatry of the rest of, of the church, um, these will have a, a uh, mark upon their foreheads. Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And in verse 6 it says that um, they should begin at my sanctuary. Which is an important statement because in First Peter 4.17 it also says that judgment must begin at the house of God. Okay. So if the mark of a beast is a sign of the right hand of a forehead, then it must be a violation of the Ten Commandments, not some little microchip. And if it's a microchip, who's the beast? What does the book of Revelation say? In Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 11, it says this, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So clearly, those who receive the mark of the beast, bad news for them. <laughs> what does the next verse say? It says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So let's get this straight. Those who do not get the mark of the beast keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And those who receive the mark of the beast, well, they die. So obviously the mark of the beast must be uh, the uh, counterpart of not receiving a mark of the beast, and if not receiving a mark of the beast is keeping the law of God, then having a mark of the beast must be a violation of the Ten Commandments. Maybe that's why it says it's in your, in your right hand or your forehead, just as it says in the Old Testament that keeping a commandment is for a sign in your right hand or your forehead. So now, who is the beast? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20-21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In Genesis 40, verse 8, it says, And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And in Isaiah 28, verse 10, it says that precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. In other words, when you study the Bible, it has to be a little bit over here, 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 putting it all together, you come up with a message, which you have to then give to someone else. Interpretations belong to God, and prophecy is not of any private interpretation. Genesis 40, verse 8, and 2 Peter 1, verse 20. And by the way, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20 So, surely, the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants for prophets. Amos 3.7 So get this, prophecy is not a private interpretation. Interpretations belong to God. We have to study line upon line the whole Bible in order to understand the whole of Revelation. If we do not use the Bible to explain the prophecies, there's no light in us, and if we are God's servants, God will explain prophecies to us. 2 Peter 1 verse 20, uh, Genesis 40 verse 8, Isaiah 8 20, Isaiah 28 verse 10, and Amos 3 verse 7. So firstly, who is the beast? Let's just have a brief history lesson on the prophecies of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, the king Nebuchadnezzar dreams of this image, and it represents the nations which will come after, her, after him. The head of gold represented Babylon. The breast and arms represented Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs represented Greece. The legs of iron represented Rome. And the ten toes, which came at the end, represented the modern nations of Europe, and then the papacy came amongst them. But the papacy is not part of the Ten Toes. The Ten Toes were the Saxons, who became the English, the Franks, who became the French, the Alemanni, who became the Germans, the Visigoths, who became the Spanish, the Suevi, who became the Portuguese, the Lombards, who became the Italians, the Burgundians, who became the Swiss, and then there were three others known as the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths.
When we come to Daniel chapter 7, there's even more information given on the history of these nations. It says, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and then the second like a bear, and then lo, another like a leopard. And then the fourth one, behold the fourth beast, it doesn't really have a description, it just says it had great iron teeth. So remember that, they come out of the sea, the first is like a lion, second like a bear, third like a leopard, and fourth one that has great iron teeth. These also represent the nations of the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And remember that in the time Revelation was written, it was the kingdom of Rome which is ruling. Rain check. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, upon his, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto what? A leopard. And his feet were as the feet of what? A bear. And his mouth was as the mouth of what? A lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. That is, that's interesting here, that this beast here is like a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion, almost exactly matching what uh, Daniel says when he says that four great beasts came up from the sea, the first was like a lion, the second like a bear, and the third one like a leopard. Pretty interesting to me. This meant that the papacy which is what it's talking about in Revelation 13, would have the worst and most vile characteristics of the three main preceding nations which came before it, most similar to the leopard, which was Greece, the nation uh, just before it, then a little bit uh, more, more similar also to Medo-Persia, the nation before that, the bear, and also a little bit similar to the nation even before that, Babylon, the lion. And it's interesting that in Revelation it says he has the mouth of a lion because it was Nebuchadnezzar who first fought to speak blasphemous words. It was Nebuchadnezzar who, make that, who made that giant statue uh, six across, six across and sixty high, six, 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 and, um, and caused all to worship before it, paralleling the mark of the beast. And because Nebuchadnezzar represents uh, the lion in Daniel 7, uh, or the kingdom of Babylon, the lion in Daniel 7, then that's why it says in Revelation 13 that he had the mouth or the same attitude as a lion. Now in Revelation 17, it gives the same description of the beast. Revelation 17:3 says, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Notice it gives the same description as is found in Revelation 13, it says, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the one that rises up from sea and is like a leopard, lion, sorry, like a leopard, a bear and a lion. So Revelation 17.3 says it's really a woman sitting, sitting upon a scarlet coloured beast. In prophecy, what does a woman mean and what does a beast mean? Well, let's go back to Daniel 7 again, where it speaks about the uh, lion and the bear and the leopard. In Daniel chapter 7, it says, Four great beasts came up from the sea. When we come down to verse 17, it says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And when we come to verse 23, it says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. So clearly here, in prophecy, a beast is a kingdom. So when it says a woman is sitting upon a scarlet-coloured beast, it clearly means that something is going to join itself to a, to a nation or a kingdom. And by the way, it does say that this kingdom will be diverse from all kingdoms. Why will it be diverse? Because it's sitting upon a woman. And what does a woman represent in, in prophecy? In Jeremiah 6 verse 2 it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. And again, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, it says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the Church of Christ is presented as Christ's bride to Jesus himself. 
And in prophecy, in Jeremiah, it says that I have likened the daughter of Zion to a covenant delicate woman. So there we have it. In prophecy, a woman is a church. That's why Revelation says that um, it was a woman sitting upon a scarlet coloured beast. In other words, it was a church which joined a nation, which was the history of the Vatican. That's why Daniel says that he shall be utterly diverse from all nations, every other nation before or after it. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom, and he, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. And get this, the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. I've already told you what those kings were. And another shall arise after them. This other one is called the papacy. He shall be diverse from the first. Why is he diverse? Because he's also a church. And he shall subdue three kings. This prophecy about subduing three kings is pretty important. Do you remember that there are those three other ones called the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths? Well, they were pretty upfront about saying, Mr. Vatican, you cannot become a church and state. We won't allow it. We are going to, we are going to fight against you, and we are not going to have it. But uh, in the books of history, it says that the Vatican prevailed against them. The Heruli were the first ones to fall in 493 AD. The Vandals went a few years later, in 534 AD, and the Ostrogoths, which put up with them till the last, were extinguished finally in 538 AD. And then it was in 538 AD that Vigilus ascended the papal chair under, under the military protection of Belsarius, and then established the system of the Vatican, a church and a state, together. And what is another prophecy about the Antichrist? It says that this beast here has seven heads. What do the seven heads mean? Revelation verse no, uh, 17 verse 9 says, Here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. It is within the city of Rome, called the City on Seven Hills, that the entire area of Vatican State proper is now confined. Now, in Revelation 13, it gives even more detail. It says, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. What does this mean? Well, the deadly wound points to the downfall of the papacy in 1798. Napoleon went in under the command of General Berthier during the French Revolution and captured the Pope and took him to France. And then the Pope was sort of he ceased to be the ruler in Rome, and the entire uh, um, system of church and state was completely broken. In terms of Catholicism, that's called a deadly wound. And the time difference between these two dates, 538 AD and 1798 AD, is exactly 1,260 years. Prophecy number 5, 6, and 7 are found in Revelation 17, 8, where it says, Behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Prophecy declares here that this beast will be in power at one time and then it'll be inactive, and then it will come back to power. In other words, it'll be a beast that was in power, is not in power, and yet is back in power. Does history confirm these three events took place with the Vatican? The Vatican became a church and state power when Vigilus ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Balsarius in the year 538 AD. The Vatican lost its church and state power when Napoleon sent in General Berthier in 1798 and abolished the papal government and established a secular one. Then on July 7, 1929, we read, This morning there was another sovereign independent state in the world. 
Premier Mussolini and Cardinal Gaspari signed the sovereign independent state of Vatican City into existence. The Vatican regained its church and state power. The prophecy was fulfilled. The Vatican was a power from 538 AD to 1798 AD. It was not a power from 1798 to 1929. Then as of July of 1929, we see it is a power once again. Prophecy number eight. Revelation 13 verses five and seven. State power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months to make war with the saints. In prophecy, a day equals a year. A biblical month equals 30 days. This means 42 months equals 1,260 years in prophecy. In Revelation 12, when it's describing a true church, it says that the woman had to flee into the wilderness where she, where she has a place prepared of God. They should flee to her there 1,260 days. Then when we come to verse 14, it says she has to go into the, sorry, she has to go into the wilderness where she is nourished for a time, a times and half a time from the face of the serpent. That's three and a half times. When we come to Daniel, it also mentions about three and a half times. Daniel 7.25, it says that he should think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. Three and a half times. Three and a half times is three and a half prophetic years. And because in the Jewish calendar there are 12 months in the year, that would therefore mean 42 months, because um, 12 multiplied by 3 is 36, and then another half the year, another 6, is 42. That's why when Revelation 13, it says, It was given unto him to make war with the saints. How long? 40 and 2 months. 42 months, that's prophetic months, to make war with the saints. And in Bible prophecy, there's 30 days in a month. Uh, I don't have time right now, but see the, link, uh, see the verses on your screen right now. You have to see Genesis. It talks about 30 days there being in a month. Which means that 42 months is exactly 1,260 days. That's why the, the woman had to flee into a wilderness where she has a place prepared of God, 1,203 score days. And in prophecy, a day really represents a year. That's why in Ezekiel 4 verse 6, that's why in Ezekiel 4 verse 6 it says, I have appointed thee each day for a year. On March 12, 2000, Pope John Paul II admitted in a globally publicized mea culpa that the Vatican did in fact kill millions of people between the years 538 AD to 1798 AD. Now just do the math. 1798 minus 538 equals 1,260 years that Rome was allowed to make war with the saints. For teaching faith contrary to the teaching of the Church of Rome, History records the martyrdom of more than 100 million people. But the Vatican was ruling for exactly 1,260 years, just as the prophecy said, between 538 AD, when the Ostrogoths went down, until 1798, when Napoleon was established. And then we also have this business of 600, three score and six, 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 six. What can that mean? Well, in Revelation it says that it is the number of a man, and his number shall be 600, three score and six. In Revelation, it talks about the mark, and the name of the beast, and the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. So in other words, the beast is led by a man. The man has a name. The name has a numerical value. The numerical value on the name is 600, three score and six, meaning the Pope's name will add up to 600, three score and six. What does the Catholic Church say that the name of the Pope is? 
The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these. Vicarius Filii Dei, which is the Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. Catholics hold that the Church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Hence, to the Bishop of Rome, as head of the Church, was given the title Vicar of Christ. That's from our Sunday visitor, Catholic Weekly, Bureau of Information, Huntington Industrial, April 18th, 1950. So, Vicarius Filii Dei, what does that add up to? This is Vicarius Filii Dei in Latin. If we add up the Roman numerals for Vicarius, we come up to with 112. When we add up the Roman numerals for Filii, we come up with 53. When we add up the Roman numerals for Dei, we come up with 501. And so the Latin title, Vicarius Filii Dei, which translated means Vicar of the Son of God, adds up to 112 plus 53 plus 501, which does indeed total 666. This is the official title of the Pope. But it doesn't end there. We also have Ludovicus, which means Vicar of the Court. And in Latin, Ludovicus does add up to 666. 50 plus 5 plus 500 plus 0 plus 5 plus 1 plus 100 plus 5 and 0, 666. Dux Clary, which means Captain of the Clergy. 500 plus 5 plus 10, and Clary is 150, 0, 0 and 1. So in other words, 515 plus 151 totals 666. Again, Rex Latinus Sacerdus which means king of the Roman priests, or king of the Latin priests. Rex comes to 10, Latinus comes to 56, and Sacerdos comes to 600, which totals 666. But it doesn't end there. The Vatican also calls itself Sancta Lux Dei, which means Holy Light of God. And Sancta Lux Dei, does also add up to 666. Conclusively proving that the Vatican is the beast mentioned in Revelation. And what does the Vatican say about its own mark? It says, of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change, Saturday Sabbath to Sunday, was her act, and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. H. F. Thomas, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons, November 11th, 1895. Sunday is our mark of authority. The Church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic Record of London, Ontario, September 1st, 1923. So in other words, the mark of the beast is Sunday keeping. In your right hand or your forehead, a violation of the law of God. It is not a microchip, for no man will pluck them out of my father's hands.
Now unfortunately because of time, that's all we have time for today in this video. But before I leave you, I want to leave you with one more verse. In Revelation 12, when it describes the true church, it says in verse 17, Here are they that keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The true church keeps the commandments of God. And because they keep the commandments of God, they have something called the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is the testimony of Jesus Christ? In Revelation 19 verse 10 it says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So in other words, those who keep the commandments of God will have the spirit of prophecy. Or in other words, those who obey the Sabbath commandments will have the gift of understanding prophecy. So in order to know about prophecy, you have to listen to the churches that keep the Sabbath, and not the Sunday-keeping churches. The theories of the secret rapture, the theories of the seven-year tribulation, and the theories that the mark of the beast is a physical microchip are all completely incorrect. And it's your job as a student of prophecy to learn what the Bible says. Thank you for watching. Prophecy number nine. He, the beast, shall think to change times and laws. Daniel 7.25. Daniel says the Vatican will think to have the authority to change times and laws. Do they actually think this? The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate or change laws. The Pope is of great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claim to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From beginning to end of scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first.